What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. Most importantly, welcome back to Behind the Business of Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. This is the fourth series, the fourth season of the series. Starts today, goes all the way through the NFL draft. So we'll be putting out nine, 10, maybe 12 interviews. I'm not very good at math, so y'all can figure that out. Started the series four years ago. The point of the series is to bring on people within the fantasy sports industry that I think are innovative, that I think are thoughtful, that I think do things differently, do them at a very high level, very efficient, and are changing the way the space moves into the future. We don't do any player talk, okay? We're not talking rookie. We're not talking dynasty. We're not talking season long. We are talking only marketing, branding, business, revenue, social media, engagement, and innovation within the fantasy sports space. I bring on one guest each week to talk about just that. To be honest, it's easily my favorite piece of content that I make on this channel, and I hope you guys enjoy it. If you've missed any of the previous episodes, I believe this is number 27 or 28. There are a lot of content pieces prior to this, so you can go check out the playlist on the YouTube channel. I think it's called Behind the Business of Fantasy Football. So again, welcome back to the channel. Let's tuck our shirts in. Let's stop yelling, and let's welcome the first guest. So I'm joined today by someone that I consider to be a friend, somewhat of a, a mentor and underrated entrepreneur, in my opinion, not only in the uh, fantasy space, but just overall. You guys know him as a co-host of the Fantasy Footballers podcast. You know him as a co-host of the Spitballers podcast, and you know him all over the Twitter sphere. These guys are everywhere. I'm pumped to bring you back onto the show, Andy. You are the first three-time guest. Uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to get you to to those Tom Brady numbers. You know, I was gonna say we got a ways to go there for for every for Tom. every time I bring you back on, he just seems to win another championship. So it feels like we're gonna be <laughs> we're just gonna be chasing Tom Brady for the goat status for a long time. <laughs> uh, but I, I really lo I look forward to these conversations with you each and every year. They're they're super insightful for me. They're super insightful for the audience. Tons of value comes out of this, and these are some of my favorite conversations. With that, I, I welcome you back onto the show. How are you over there? What's going on in the studio? How's your week been? How's your you know, off season been since the Super Bowl ended and uh, what's going on, man? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me back on. It's always a lot of fun to chat and um, it's always very engaging. You know, you spend your whole year talking about rookie picks or trades or, you know, all the questions we get. And it's fun to talk about the business behind behind fantasy and entrepreneurship and some of these things that I know you're very interested in. And a lot of people out there are interested in and building a brand and doing those things. So it's always really engaging and fun to talk about them. Uh, we're doing good out here. I think we're we're in uh, part of us is just filled with gratitude of getting through a whole season and getting to the Super Bowl and and we're kind of in that fantasy football season come down mode a little bit and we'll be getting into the the rookie stuff and no we're just we're just thankful I mean this the, this past year was it was a year man it, it was something special the only way this, and uh, this year was the weather outside is weather this year was a year man. That's it. That's it. So we uh, we're thankful that we made it through, and um, we're just looking forward to 2021 and and a little bit more normalcy. And you 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 kind of got humbled a little bit, and you realized that you can only plan so far into the future. But um, we're excited about what's what's to come. Yeah. So speaking of normalcy, like I'm curious what you guys do in the off season. I know you scale back the shows a lot. You know, once summer ramps up, you guys are five days a week and more with the other pieces of content that you guys are putting out. I know you scale down to, I believe, two shows a week from now until, you know, a few months down the line. Myself, I'm, I feel like I, you know, as, as a full-time content creator, I almost kind of put my, uh, put pressure on myself to put stuff out there like every day. It doesn't necessarily have to be the fantasy show, but I feel some kind I don't know if it's a responsibility or if it's just that like you know that's what drives me each and every day but when you guys pull back what else do you have going on like what else do you fo is this is this for you guys I know you've built your business uh around your lifestyle right like you want to make sure that you have time for your family you want to make sure that you have time for other things to enjoy in life is this that part of the year where you guys have kind of been successful enough during the fantasy season and for like a six month stretch that you pull back and, and use that to focus on the family and the things that are important? Or is this more the time of the year where you focus on business things, you step back, you look at everything from, you know, a bird's eye view, you get to be a little bit more creative. So tell me, you know, when you're not doing those two shows a week or the three shows a week, including the spitballers and things like that, like what are you focusing on during this time of the year? 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's a lot of the latter thing that you mentioned, where you take the bird's eye view and you make decisions about the direction of the company. We kind of consider this our uh, development cycle for the business. So this is the opportunity to, you know, the ultimate draft kit's our biggest product, and so we spend a lot of time and effort planning out what features will be added to it or how we amplify it. It's a time to focus on the marketing strategy for the upcoming year. There, There is a degree of, you know, with the pullback of like quantity of content where that's just, you know, a healthy thing for us. I mean, during the season, we're, you know, five shows, the Footcast, Series XM, Spitballers, normally something else pops up every week. So just from like a mental health, um, maintaining our excitement and passion for fantasy standpoint it's pretty important to not be um at least for us just to be grinding every moment of of the off season on on content um you know when we when we launched it was like we were the we were the first like year round fantasy podcast committing to doing any content during this off season a lot of the other shows were just taking the entire you know 3 4 5 months off but um, but most of it's what what you had alluded to, where we're, we want to look and see where opportunities are. We want to develop our products in the right way, and and you know so that means the app and the draft kit and and strategies that we have. You know, formally before last year, we also had our our tours in the in the off season, so we were planning a lot of that in, type of things out. It's really cool to work in an industry where you do have a change of kind of the season nature of it, where you have a development cycle where you get to build product, where the content is more, you know, it's a speculative, not reporting style of things. You know, all the content now is is a lot of ground up content as opposed to just responding to what happened in fantasy. And then there is a little bit of reprieve and, and time with the family. And like the schedule is still like, we're all working full time, but like we do two shows a week so we can record in the afternoons of the day before instead of coming in and doing them super early in the morning. So we do get more time to to step away with the family. It's a nice season of transition right now. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. It, this is my favorite time of the year. It's it's so labor intensive the content during the season that once you get yeah. to step back a little bit, it, it it frees your it frees yourself a little bit, both you know mentally and and physically. So what what is uh, more specifically, like what does a day inside the fantasy footballers studio look like? Uh, let's say uh, you filmed on Tuesday, the show goes up Wednesday, and then you film on Thursday. So what what is like that Wednesday look like? You guys all go into the studio, you know, you're working full time. So you go in for the full day. What is that? Is, is it like meetings? Is it, you know, what, what does that look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of everything. Um, we've been fortunate enough to add staff over the last couple of years that are, you know, working with us on developing content from, you know, recently we brought um, Kyle uh, Borgignoni on full time to work more of the editorial side. He's always been our editor in chief. He's always done a lot of writing for us, but we brought him in full time when we started amplifying the dynasty side of our business. Uh, you know, the website is always a focus. It always seems like there's a lot of opportunity there. And then we brought in a full time web, web de developer, web developer. So um, we've been able to make progress a lot faster in some of our development er areas. So we, you know, we come in after a day we're recording and we're, we're probably prioritizing development agenda, you know, to start the day and, and meeting about specific things we want to get built out. Obviously this past week we had launched the ultimate draft kit. So, you know, a lot of, uh, kind of up to launch focus, um, was put on that, you know, we're meeting regularly with, uh, like we have our manager out in New York. So we, we meet with him about kind of progression on things like sponsorship deals, which, you know, I know you've been very transparent and talked about a lot on on your videos too about your year past and and some of those discussions. So, we're we're kind of right in February. It's a little bit interesting because you are like the appetite of like an advertiser or a sponsorship for for football is like just like the season's over and you know you're not going to be kind of having the, the nitty gritty conversations, but you're kind of collecting your list and you're building kind of what the show is going to be like next year. And, you know, we have our, our segments and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's just a mix and a, uh, you know, we're still doing the footcast and we're still doing spitballers. So we're kind of recording four out of five days still, but it's more, more focused on the development right now. Yeah. It's, it's a good mixed bag. It's what keeps it fresh each and every day, which I think is what really ultimately makes the off season fun. Well, and, and, and you do need a little bit of, uh, you know, part of the goal of adding staff or, or resources is to have, some level of margin of, of uh, when you can sit back and say, okay, how do I make the brand and the product better today? And it's not just, 
you know, wall to wall schedule because you need to be able to sit there and like brainstorm for five minutes and say, mm -hmm. wow, this isn't, you know, keeping up with the podcast industry for us, since the podcast is the core is important too. like being, you know, forward thinking about what the industry is doing and like where we need to take advantage of opportunities as opposed to like the temptation is always to just like sit back completely and um yeah well, it's, okay it's crazy established. because like you know you said you you guys were like the first kind of year-round podcast and now it feels like if you're not doing three to five shows a week even in february when the season just ended a week ago right. you're kind of falling behind like it, it's really crazy how that how that comes to to kick you that way yeah and you mentioned like you you kind of feel a sense of like you got to get content out there because stagnation would feel like you know going backwards right like there's, there's no neutral right there's either forwards or backwards and and so um but at the same time being refreshed having a passion for the product delivers a better product and and so it is a balancing act yeah i, I mean like thinking of of projecting you know I, I had talked about this in one of my videos when i go over projecting for the following year looking at different sponsorships and things like that we obviously couldn't have plan for anything that happened in 2020 it hit us quick and it definitely hit our industry uh, I, I think because we're based around content and we did fortunately have the nfl season things didn't go to plan per se but it came out much there were there were ebbs and flows throughout the off season when i was like okay this nfl season is not going to happen we got to like figure out what we're doing during the year and then it ended up happening and then there was times where i thought it wasn't you know things got really really crazy in the beginning like you're, you're a show i feel like that's built on the energy of being together like your togetherness as <laughs> you know jason mike andy the physical togetherness is something right. that i think is wildly underrated in our space you know whether it's podcasting or whether it's youtube there's a real real energy behind being together for these things and and having a, a natural connection between the people that you're doing the content with and you guys had to mistake me if i'm wrong but do these zoom calls for the first time ever right yeah 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 we had not done remote shows before until we had had to to yeah, so, so for you guys who have built a foundation on like being together and being in the same studio and doing shows that way for so long and building up a, a successful, you know, brand that way, like how difficult was it for you to adjust to the new style of like Zoom thing? Because I know, you know, when we're doing content, even with my friends, we do like one show a week where we're together. As soon as we go on Zoom, there's just like this loss of of energy. There's like a, a little yeah. a little key that's missing there and you have to figure out how to replace it through another avenue, you know? So I'm, I'm curious as for someone who's done it for so long, like what were the key adjustments that you had had to make and how difficult was it for you guys? Yeah, it, it was super weird. I mean, we were over a thousand shows together and then here we are, you know, facing the quarantine and the lockdown, especially in the early months where we were remote recording. And it, it's a weird dynamic, especially, you know, like you said, it, I think it is underrated. I think that that energy and that like being in the same room, like makes conversations and, and, and things flow in a certain way. Cause your guys' um, comedy is like very, it's very quick witted. You work off each other really well. And if on zoom, there's like a 0.3 <laughs> second delay in the lag, yeah. it like it, yeah, messes, yeah. it messes shit up and it's weird. Yeah. I think it was a pretty quick adjustment, but those first few shows definitely felt, they just felt awkward. They felt, I think they felt worse to us than maybe they even were. 100%. Um, based on the feedback that we had, you know, received after, Oh, no, you know, we loved it. And I was like, well, that, that didn't sound like a good show, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was a weird dynamic, but it, it, at the same time, you know, we were all in that survival phase it, to a degree, you know, you're just kind of doing what you need to do. You know, I think people that were looking for, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not curing diseases on this end of the microphone. We are offering you some sense of normalcy to your life. We are bringing you some comedy, we are bringing you some distraction, whatever like small uh, 1% of 1% of your life that we can bring you during that trial period of, of this last year is what we were trying to do. So it was really important to us to be consistent on that front. Try not to be very different in terms of what we're bringing to the table and just, you know, you're just kind of surviving. You're like, okay, let's get to the next week and see what happens because nobody knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Is there anything that like really stood out to you during that time period or, you know, just just that entire off season in general, you know, maybe like a, a lesson learned or something you thought was going to work really well. It didn't work well or something um, that you didn't think was going to do well. And all of a sudden kind of like blew up and you're like, wow, you know, this is something we can kind of build on. Didn't expect it to do well. Maybe something just from the period that you could like take forward with you. Obviously, you guys are not going to do like Zoom calls for your for your shows going forward now that you don't have to. But, right. You know, like wh what are some things you take away from that period? Well, I mean, one thing that kind of came as a byproduct 
of that period of time is we built out home studios. I mean, we really didn't need it. We mm -hmm. never had it. We didn't need it. We didn't do recording and live streaming from home. So we built out, you know, a corner in my master bedroom is now, you know, my home, my home workstation studio. I can record there. I can live stream there. And your wife's cool with that in the master bedroom. You know what? Yeah, dude, she is. And she's awesome. But uh, I don't I look at it. And I'm like, man, that is ugly. But um, <laughs> I mean, at this point, I'm sure you got a little bit of leverage there. Like You, you kind of needed the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, the leverage of like, hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic and I need to keep a job. So we're going to go put that in the corner. <laughs> she's but like check. OK. But she's like, all right, with that, um, she got a puppy. Everything's fine. And uh, no, but but what we did do is we did we did commit to more like little live streams and stuff in association with like product stuff. And people responded really well to that. And we got it so turnkey. We're like, you know, sometimes it felt like such a burden to have those like impromptu live type of things, especially with the three of us and get the studio going and like cost benefits. So making it turnkey turned it into something where I was like, man, I really I really enjoy hopping on. I was going to say probably the thing I took away from was the live streams as well. It became something that I didn't want to do at first, but as soon as I did, yeah. it became some of the most enjoyable pieces of cut. Like people just, they wanted to jump on and just like hang out for a while. It, it felt like a much more connected live stream than, than ones I've done in the past. It was, it was people that didn't know what to do with their day. They had so much time, but didn't have anywhere to focus it on right because everyone was working from home and like you jumped on and people were they were like so happy to see you i'm like oh this is this is cool for a change where no one's usually happy to see me on a regular basis but they want to come and hang out and ask questions and just you know be normal uh, again i think that's probably the biggest takeaway is like you treat these people as if they're normal human beings and it, it's crazy how uh excited they they will be when you do that yeah i mean i think everybody was everybody is always engaged in, you know, they like the community aspect and the engagement aspect, but even more, we were all thirsty for that with stuck in your house and, mm -hmm. and like, um, just the connection, like connection is the word, right? Like that, that is one of the f five most important words of why we've had any success at all is connection with the audience. It's why podcasting is successful. It's why good brands are successful. It's why independent uh, entities are successful. It's connection with the audience. So um, there were some kind of, you know, I've had these conversations with my family too, where like, you know, you can sit there and you can dwell on, on all the things you're, you're lacking or you're missing from the pandemic, but you can also find some, you know, nuggets of, of, you know, or some fruit in the midst of this, you know, kind of difficult time where, okay, we, we learned more about ourselves. We learned what's really important. You know, it sounds cliche, but there's a lot of things that you take for granted because they're part of your routine that you we're kind of stripped down to the bare minimum and you, you learn from it. So I think our show, you know, we had some of those benefits with the live streams and, and the home studios and, and knowing that, you know, we could, we could have one person at home and two people in the studio and still get the show done that way. And like set up the infrastructure for that because we never had to before. It just felt like a foundational year. You know, it was kind of like you had to throw the numbers out and the projections and then, and, and like growth as a top line goal and just say, like, we're here for the audience. We're here to build a foundation. We're here to kind of like push ourselves and see, you know, when we are pushed to the limit, like how successful can we be? How, how much can we pull off, you know? And like going forward, that's huge because when you get into times that are difficult, you can always look back on this time and say like, oh, we did it then we can, we could be quiet and do it now, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and it almost, you know, when we first started, it used to be that mindset of like, can we buy the next month's worth of revenue this year? You know, the mindset early on was like, Hey, can we, you know, let's just make sure we're, we're structured in a way where, if there's no season, we're, we're all right. We're going to, we'll hit the ground running in 2021. We'll eat up some reserves or we'll cut mm. our salaries or whatever we have to do. Um, let's just make sure we can get through this year, no matter what comes and, and, you know, try to prepare ourselves and had prepared ourselves in a way to do that. So, you know, and we, we, in the football industry, we got lucky. I mean, I know people that were in March madness business and yeah. you know, it, it, we got as lucky as you possibly could be in the sports yeah. business. We really did. We were super fortunate um, the NFL wasn't, you know, they weren't going to be stopped unless, you know, somebody came in and, and, you know, stopped them. So it was, it was fortunate timing wise. I think we were shocked and surprised by how many people were still engaged and, um, still involved and how successful of a year it really was in spite of all that happened. And mm -hmm. we're just thankful. Yeah. So I guess my next question was more business focused when it comes to what happened this year. And, you know, you mentioned 
you have the reserves and I'm, I assume that you guys have been successful enough in the past few years that if something happened where, you know, the entire season was wiped out and your revenue levels dropped down to something you haven't seen before, you'd be OK. But in terms of, you know, like when you're looking at these numbers, you still have to do some sort of projection because you have to look at the following year, what you're going to invest in. Do you hire another person or do you cut back now? Sure. Do you cut your salaries or things like that? So I'm curious because I got a lot of questions like, Hey, if I buy, you know, because at the time there's so much uncertainty. Hey, if I buy product X or product Y, the season doesn't happen. Do I get a refund? And I just found myself being like, ah, fuck, like, I don't I don't know. Like, we'll figure it out when we get there. You know, like how in tune were you guys with actually trying to accurately because it's a hard enough business trying to accurately project on a year to year basis because the growth is so quick during certain times and it's super seasonal. So this year in particular, like what was the mindset behind uh, projecting for business and like, how did you guys approach that? Yeah, I think that we decided pretty early on that the best way forward for the business was to assume a season from the sense of like our timing with the UDK launch, because, you know, that doesn't mean we weren't preparing. We ran runway estimations. We're figuring out all the adjustments we would make and and what things we would have to do. But when I was look when we were looking at, you know, how do you approach selling the UDK and how do you approach timing and how do you approach features like any moment in time there where we decide we're going to press pause on some of that stuff was going to be a tangible loss to the business if a season happened. And so it was a balancing act of, of those two dynamics where it's like, okay, you need to know what you're going to do if this doesn't happen. But we didn't want to like sacrifice four months worth of development work just because um, it was up in the air. I, we just didn't feel like that was a smart thing to do. So when it came to launching the UDK pre-sales, I think we were really fortunate in the fact that we proceeded as normal. Now, of course, that was a little bit before the pandemic. We normally launched that on Super Bowl Sunday, but we put so much effort into those pre-sales that we had a lot of front-loaded sales before any of the like uncertainty hit for people. So that was beneficial from a cash flow perspective. You know, we didn't have to you know, you had like a month and a half before uncertainty started to hit the market and uncertainty but, was But a couldn't thing. that also end up being a problem? We don't have the season. Did you guys, were you guys thinking about refunding the customers? Oh yeah, we, we would have refunded all of it. Actually, what we did is we would have offered a refund to everybody. Or next year. Who requested it. But the default would have been, um, you're going to get the, we built the content, right? Like the risk was more than just the money. The risk was we're going to build all the content. We're going to put in all the effort. You're going to have the entire draft get built to the brim. Like on June 1st, that's when the draft get launches. It's got all the content, all the videos, all the projections, all the everything. Might not have a season. So the, the kind of the mindset was, look, here, you're going to get that for free. And then you're going to get next year. So you're going to get two draft kits for the price of one. If you stick around, if you want a refund, we'll give it to you. Um, and that's kind of what we conveyed in our kind of like terms of, of buying it. And we might it. You know, we wanted that out there that like, if you buy this and there's no season, you know, you're going to get the benefit of having consumed it for four months. And then you're going to, we figured that was enough goodwill probably for most people not to refund it. Yeah. But if they wanted a refund, we were going to respect that because this is a time of year where people were, you know, money is tight. So. Yeah. So that's such a, that's the tough part because, you know, this, this COVID thing could have, that doesn't only impact this year. Obviously it kills your, it, yeah. Actually, oh, it would I guess kill next year too. Yeah, it, kill, it would have killed next year too, and like yeah. that makes things yeah. that makes things so difficult. I'm I'm wondering like what percent. That's probably something I would have done, and I would have been like super reluctant to to have offered something like that. But I'm curious as to like what do you think estimate wise? Like what percentage of people probably would have taken you up on that offer? I would say I would say almost anyone who's buying refund? it ahead of time probably for you guys is like super loyal to you guys, and I would assume it it probably would have been at like almost at 85 to 90 plus hit rate on that. Yeah, I would have said I, I would guess we would have had five percent or fewer refunds requests yeah. on on all udks because it, it, it's one thing you know you buy it and you're in it and you're using it instantaneously so as long as we took care of those people in the right way which would have been giving them access to next year i think that we would have been around that 95 that was our guesstimate you know that's kind of where we thought and that and that's where it was like okay this year would be upside down next year would be weird but we'd get through it right we would get through it on next year being weird maybe the money will be fine i'm i'm really curious to see what happens with the industry as a whole, because obviously we had a drop off in consumership, especially your audience and my audience. Just the fact that we have uh, a large portion of people really ramping up and, and getting into our content for the first time from, you know, August 15th through September 15th. 
And those are, you know, you could say fly by season long players. And those are the people that are in leagues with their coworkers or yeah. college friends yeah. or family or whatever. Those are probably the least strong type of leagues. And those are probably the leagues that also didn't have leagues this year, right? Because if you're like, if you're kind of connected through the fantasy league and then people are like, ah, I don't know if I want to throw money into it and then try to figure it out as it goes, we might not have a season. A lot of those leagues dropped off. I'm curious to see, you know, if, if, if those leagues were kind of hanging on by a thread to begin with, do they even jump back into the game next year? You know, say we dropped off from a viewership of 100% the year before down to 60% this year or something like that. I'm curious to see what the Delta in that 40% is like if, you know, the, we're not going to get 40% of those people back, but is it 30? Is it 20? Is it only 10%? I'm, I'm curious to see the long-term effects of this whole thing on the industry, to be honest. Yeah, that's that's kind of the di discussion on how much pent up demand there is for people to return, people mm -hmm. returning to the stadiums, excitement for the game. The one thing to remember from last year, or you know, from 2020 as well, on top of the pandemic, is it, it was an election year, and when the election year happened um, four years ago, it was a down year for NFL ratings, and it was a it was kind of a a softer growth year for the fantasy football kind of space as well. Interesting, just because because of interest. So the league saw that hit during the election year as well. And so you had those things compounding this year, but at the same time, you kind of had some counterbalance in the fact that, you know, people didn't have anything to do the the TV demand. I, I think you remember when like the NBA was starting to come back and how insane it was that first week with them back on television, live sports, we hadn't seen live sports in forever and, and, and fantasy is something that people can do from their couch if they're interested in it too. So we really didn't, we didn't feel a huge impact from the pandemic mm -hmm. year in terms of listenership or viewership. I think the growth rate was capped by yeah. exactly what you're saying. But um, I do think 2021 is is really primed to be kind of whether it's, you know, I know we were talking a little bit about stock market and stuff, whether it's just the optimism in the world for the next year, um, I think is going to lead to a lot of uh, good things. I agree. I think I think we're going to bounce back stronger as as a whole, just, you know, as a country, and as uh, internationally too, from everything. I think there's a lot of bad negative media out there. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think most people inherently do want the connection. I think most people inherently are good. And I think most people inherently will kind of go back to the to the norm that we had quicker than most well, people assume. Yeah, I agree. And I think one thing too, like if you, you had to look at it, like what opportunity can we, like we're full time doing this. And a lot of people in this space aren't full time or they're part time or we had the luxury of being able to work through that. And we don't, we're curious about what market share we, we grabbed, but don't know about, right? Because maybe we grab some, but then like you said, maybe there's 30% of people that didn't play in those leagues that they normally would have and consume content. But we were able to put out content during the year consistently. You were able to put out content consistently. So what market share did you grab from from anybody else that wasn't able to do that, that 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 wasn't able to put out content because the year was a different kind of year. So those are some questions that I think we, you know, anybody that's doing it full time is going to get to see in August. Interesting. September. Yeah. So you're, you're saying like what part of the audience that did watch. So a lot of the people that dropped off might have been your original audience members. So, you know, there was a hole left there. So maybe a lot of the viewership that kept you afloat was new members. And we're going to see almost like a, a double dipped spike coming into this year. Yeah, for those that did play, when they looked for content, there might have been less content out there Got you. than years past because of people didn't have the opportunity to put it out there in, in a year like this. So, you know, there may have been more market share, but you couldn't determine that because 30% of people didn't play. So maybe you'll get to see that bear out over the next year. We've mentioned the UDK a few times, so congratulations again on another year of that dropping and the pre-orders going up, and I'm sure the you know the numbers are doing well over there. I'm, I'm curious about something that you guys have, have been clearly very excited about throwing into the uh, into the UDK for the first time this year is that dynasty pass. Now we've, we've talked about the, the, the year long content machine that is fantasy mm -hmm. football and dynasty fortunately has almost made that much easier for us because now we have demand for it to be year long. Whereas like, yes, you did, but it almost like didn't make sense to a lot of people, but we've been able to kind of funnel a lot of people into the, into the dynasty world. So, what are what, what were your thoughts behind adding Dynasty into it? Was it like half because you guys play it and really enjoy it and you were like, oh, okay, this is something that we'd enjoy adding into? Or was it you stepping back, looking at the landscape and just like Dynasty is almost, at least in our circle, like if you talk about fantasy football Twitter, I would almost say Dynasty is, if not more engaging than season long, like right there. 
Yeah, I mean, we love Dynasty. Dynasty's engaging. It's fun. We play in keeper leagues. Anything that keeps your league and people talking all year long and where you can think about it all year long is super engaging and fun. Now, that doesn't mean it's the right thing to add to the draft kit or to the business just because we like it. I think we got to the point where we said enough people are playing Dynasty where, you know, all redraft content really fits a Dynasty person, right? Like they can they can benefit from it. You talk about a player, you talk about a player, but it's not necessarily in reverse. And a lot of people who play Dynasty want Dynasty content early. When we've launched the UDK, it's always been June 1st. You've got a little bit of early access to some rookie and Dynasty rankings, but pre-order meant like, you know, you pre-order and then you wait and then it launches. So what we had wanted to do is really just be able to create added value for our combo version of the product. And, and that meant three things. I mean, like the, the DFS pass was always part of it. Not everybody plays DFS. Not everybody plays in a state that can play DFS. Shout out to Arizona. We're like this close Shout right out now. to New York as well. We're probably not yeah. that close, but. Oh my goodness. I, well, I thought we'd be like the last state in the, in the country, but we've got a bill out there that I think is going to pass like this week. So let's go. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's lose that money, baby. <laughs> let's lose that money. But, oh man, to be able to actually play, that'd be nice. But then like Dynasty is a whole nother segment. And then we wanted to add something else that was like a tool. So we're, we're adding a draft analyzer as well that's going to launch with the the UDK Plus. That'll grade your draft, give you an evaluation of, of strengths, weaknesses, and things like that. So we just kind of wanted to maximize the value in that UDK Plus. And re, you know, we rebranded that from just being the, the UDK and DFS combo. And so it's really neat to be able to offer something that is available instantaneously right now. So if you pre-order, you get the added benefit of like, I can log on, I can consume write-ups on the rookie classes and our rookie rankings and team opportunities and, and, and production profiles and like just dive right into it. So that made the most sense to us is like, it's always a timing thing. We've talked about doing that with Dynasty in the past. This was the year where we were like, okay, let's make that transition. Hopefully people respond well to it and and give it a go. So that's that's where that kind of came from. And I, I think Dynasty is growing a lot, but you know, it's still a, a pretty small segment in terms of the the, the big picture. Yeah, but in in the niches are the gold, man. I think people will respond really, really well to that for you guys. I mean, we uh we did the same thing last year because we've had like the season long guide, but we we did a, a rookie yeah. dynasty guide specific for that last year and it did it did pretty well and I expect us to continue to grow on it. We actually pivoted off my main YouTube channel and started a, a completely dynasty, dynasty focused, only. Yeah. Yeah. Dynasty only. And it's, it's growing like really, really well right now uh, in the off season. People absolutely love it because again, like when you find those niches and, and bear down on it, man, because people are, people are thirsty for it. Um, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, it's just kind of like, it's almost like the betting world where like, if you're knee deep in it, you're going to pay for resources and content that feed that, you know, year round passion. So like you said, with the niche side, you, uh, you really engage the, the hardcore players. This, this really feels like the, you know, I, I think we've had this conversation on these series before, but like talking about what's the next like breakout thing in fantasy, this, this feels like a new era of, of almost like a product that you can offer customers and, and really give value to an audience. It's season long, it's DFS dynasty feels like it is almost in its own category. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, you said a lot of the season long content that you do does dictate um, things that would help you for dynasty, but a lot of people, I think, will start transitioning to Dynasty content. I think unless you're actually playing Dynasty, like unless you're really in leagues, it's not as simple as just going like player for player and looking at uh, analysis on players. There's there's so much more strategy to Dynasty. There's so many more pieces that you're looking at. I think it's something that you could tell very quickly people doing the analysis on Dynasty, whether or not they, they really know what they're doing, and whether or not they're actually playing in these Dynasty leagues. So I think that's another opportunity for people that really are in the niche of it to separate themselves because there's a very clear line between people that that do it and don't do it. Yeah. And any, anything that you're really excited about, you want content made specifically for it. I mean, that's what you're pursuing and you're looking for. So makes yeah. Sense. So let me let me ask you, like you adding this new piece to the to the UDK, the whole dynasty side of things. This is something that I am. Um, I don't know if I want to say like struggling with, but working on just the centralization of all the offerings that that you have, because I find myself struggling to you know I, I hate like pitching my audience but like we have a lot of we have a lot of stuff i want them to know about you can only spend so much time throughout your shows being like go here go here go here you know there's there's merchandise there's patreon there's the draft guide there's sponsorships yeah. that you got to plug oh, yeah. in and they're all you know it's been very difficult to find something that can that can bring them all all together and you guys have the same thing like you have a lot of different offerings to find in a lot of different places have you guys you know, sat down and said like, okay, let's find a, a software. Let's find uh, a membership plugin for WordPress that can do 
e-products that can also do a membership thing that can the way i'm thinking about it is like i want to cut out as many like middlemen as possible like i don't want to be i'm on patreon but i don't want to be on patreon not because i necessarily want them to i don't care about like the five percent that they're taking if they're going to set up a whole ass platform and have it nicely organized for me that's <laughs> that's great but like it becomes crazy for the customers at some point you know like they don't even, oh 100 my friends don't even know where to, they're like where can i get a sweatshirt like i've been trying to find it on here and here and here and i can't find it like you guys have these discussions often Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, the, the specifically to Patreon. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a, it's a pure love hate with, Dude, th with is there anyone like on Patreon. Patreon that actually wants to be on Patreon? Like probably not. Right. No, probably not. And, uh, and yet at the same time, it's like, we owe so much to Patreon because of, of, of what they've represented to our business, especially from day one. You hate yeah. We thought, I, I heard you talk about, um, centralization on, I don't remember one of your videos. I heard you start to talk about it. A week or two ago and and my reaction was like okay nick as normal uh, knows exactly what he's talking about and what's important we struggle with it because it's not if we started our business today we would start it differently than it is structured now in terms of those pieces we would like our customers to have the most seamless not confusing don't send our support staff an email because you don't know how to sync your Patreon to our website to buy a product. And why can't I just do this? And why can't like all of that sucks and it should all 100% be fixed and it should all 100% be centralized in a perfect world. However, as a business, you have to step back and you have to say, well, this sector, this sec, you know, these three ver spaces, UDK, Patreon, uh, whatever, are they growing in their existing environment? Um, what is the risk of, of making like a monumental transition and forcing people to transition from what they're routinely in into a new environment? And it, you know, is it worth us spending three developers like a year to develop the, the, the system that may make us less money and, or be a net negative or, or, or a neutral? Like that's the balance that we always have as a company is it's like, we want to, we have plans and steps in place to do those things. And we've tried to make them easier and easier and better and better. And we've been able to centralize our products a little bit in the account and, and try to simplify that side. But I am just, I laughed because I just a hundred percent relate to that mindset. I think the number one thing you should do as a company is try to make that easier. I, we don't want to pitch 50 things to anybody. And we certainly don't see any reason in like spinning up five other things to try to make money and then like robbing Peter to pay Paul because you, we got to chase an IDP thing over here to sell. And then all of a sudden, you know, you only have so much, what I say is, is marketing or like show capital to use. Like exactly. we're only going to talk about one thing when we talk about our thing. And if we have 10 things, we're still going to talk about one thing. So it's just, you know, we don't want to do that to our listenership. And um, if we could snap our fingers and rebuild it today, we wouldn't be on Patreon. We would have a singular membership. Uh, all the products would be folded underneath that. It would be a singular app. You know, there's a lot of things that we would do with that. And I think we'll get there, but we're going to try to do it in a way that's super measured and smart and, you know, doesn't undermine all of the goodwill of everybody that's committed and is in the system and is in the community and likes the routine of the community. And like, that's what has to be, you know, thought through in a very, very careful way, or you just spin your wheels for no reason. You just, you just spend a year paying money and development time to be net neutral. And that would be stupid. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing over here because like one of the things I, uh, I sent you over that I wanted to talk about was just like pivoting in general. And, and where I see us differ a lot from you guys is I'm I'm very like stop on a dime drastic. Let's start doing this shit over here. Let's do over here. And you're talking about, you know, being thoughtful and making sure you're not spinning <laughs> your wheels. And like, I, I don't know. I just like if, if I feel like something feels right. I try to do it. I also, of course, am not embedded to two other co-owners and, and people that I have on salary and, and all these other things I have to think about. And you guys are obviously at a massive scale that making a pivot like that, just, just simply one of Patreon to a membership website would probably cut out 25% of your members just off the fact that they don't want to put their new credit card into, into the new site or something. So what we're working on right now is basically pivoting everything to just one WordPress website where- yeah we'll probably have to spend up for a bunch of different plugins that offer you the ability to have uh, e-commerce products, uh, merch products, uh, all these different things that you can, wh what, I, what I want to do is have one very simple website. They go on, they can add everything to the cart 
straight from the homepage. Like, okay, I want a t-shirt. I want a membership website. I want the draft guide. Boom, 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 boom. Like that. Cause I feel like there's so much, uh, like upsell opportunity in a sense. It's not even upsell, like in, in, uh, in a bad intention way, but, but just being on the website and just seeing it there, 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 just the ease of use is, is, is there. So we're, we're working very hard on that right now. And it's, it's becoming like, kind of what you said, like it's, it's becoming a little bit messy because we're trying to do it within a time frame and have this set up quickly. But, um, it, it's, it's gotten almost over my head and I have to work with an app developer. And this is one of the very few times in my life where we're doing something in my brand where I don't personally know how to actually do it, which makes me, um, a little bit uncomfortable, I guess, you know, like I sure. can't dive in and be like, okay, let me just spend the next 48 hours, like brushing this up and doing this right. And, and, and messing around with it. Cause I just don't, I don't know how to do it. So any, uh, I guess like words of wisdom or advice for things that you don't know how to do that you let other people do. And I'm just like off the rails here. <laughs> I, um, you know, it's been a transition as we've grown. I'm a pretty type a kind of guy. And, uh, I'm also really protective of our brand. You know, I want things to be uh, that's, that's the whole beauty of independence, right? Like we have control over our brand and what people, um, consume. So I had, you know, I've had to go through that period of time of entrusting that to our team, to individuals on our team, you know, try to become more of the vision person than the execution person on a daily basis. Because I mean, when we started, I built, I mean, we, we three did everything. We built, I built the website. I kept the website up to date and sold every product and, you know, Mike did every bit of audio and Jason helped with every bit of, you know, posting and article. I mean, it was every little bit of control was within our hands. You know, I, it, it's been different for me to, to transition into trusting the team, but I can say that every single step of the way, it's been better for the company when you find the right people to do that. So I guess the, the core message that I'm pulling from my own words is, do you have the right person doing it? Because that will assuage that doubt and fear or trepidation when you have a trust, right? That trust being built is the next step of the business growing. So having the right people, knowing that you have the right people is probably so foundational to the next step of a business that um, it allows you and frees you up to be the vision person, to be able to speak into that, to trust. And, you know, we've got, I always say it like our developer that we found, which was comedic because when we put the call out to find somebody, we said we needed to replace Andy with another Andy and his name's Andy. So it okay. <laughs> happened on accident, but it's like when I come to him with feedback, it's always like one iteration away from perfection. It's like he does it, I give feedback and then it ends up the right way. Like that is a beautiful thing inside of a business. If you find the right people, I think you get, get to where you want to go and it, it calms you down. <laughs> yeah. I, I think one thing I've noticed too is anytime, not anytime, I've definitely had this backfire, but mo more often than not, when you give people the responsibility of doing something, they tend to come back with, with something that really surprises you. And people are a lot, um, for, for my sake, people are a lot smarter and, and more creative and uh, more hardworking and just uh, trustworthy than maybe I've given them credit for at the beginning. So there's probably a lot of leverage there. And it's just, you know, when you have so much going on, it just, it's almost like this built up anxiety that you need everything to be perfect. So yeah, if you have ahead. a conviction that something should be a certain way and it's not that way yet, then you might have to let go of the timeline a little bit too, you know, where it's like dynasty came to the UDK at the right time. You know, there's certain yeah. products, the redo of the website, it, you know, we could do everything we want to do tomorrow. If I hire a hundred people, do I want to hire a hundred people? Do I want that business? You know, you talk about pivoting. We talk about certain levels of stability or headroom in our existing things. Both of those are great. It, what do you love doing? I mean, you're building your business. Do you love, if you love pivoting and running after the next, why not run your business that way? I mean, I I think that that's the bigger message, right? Of, of being an independent business. Yeah, I, I think that it's pretty head on. You know, I try, I'm trying to build up a, a sort of a lifestyle brand and I guess it, it works in the fact that my, my life is kind of like that. And there's a lot of pivots and a lot of instability going on here. So it makes sense that it kind of pours over into the business. And, you know, just talking about like, pivoting in a sense you guys might not do it on a general business scale but i am curious because i listened to the, a, uh, the ama that you guys recorded i want to say like a month ago or so and someone had asked you if you guys ever thought about doing other podcasts you know what you know what would they be focused on and uh the the answers from you three were 
unsurprising to me. You know, you had Mike and Jason who are very into like the pop culture and the entertainment side of this stuff. So they said they would do something around there. And then your answer again, no surprise to me was something more around entrepreneurship. So have you ever actually seriously thought about doing some type of content that was specifically uh, focused on that? If that's, you know, what you enjoy so much? Uh, I thought about it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I don't know in what form or shape that will take. I mean, it always feels it's like these doing these pods with you or anytime I get to talk about stuff in the business realm, it's just engaging and fun to me. It's kind of the, you know, a little bit. I'm just going to throw this out here and feel free to (laughs) feel free to say no. But listen, if you wanted, if you wanted to do a weekly pod, I would put all the work (laughs) in. I would come up with the show Uh, sheet. I would do the editing and we could put it out there, man. I'm, I'm, I'm a hundred percent down on that. We, we can talk about it. It, it. It's something that's fun and it's engaging for sure. And it's it's like, I've always said I liked it more than fantasy. Like I like building the business more than fantasy football. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love, and I love fantasy football. So that's like the, the, the comparison there. But yeah, I mean, I've thought about that. I've thought about things down the line in terms of like, it'd be fun to write. You know, I've always, I grew mm-hmm. up always wanting to write, you know, so it'd be fun to write someday or like, you know, take the experiences that we've gained from, you know, starting a business and try to share some things on that front. We all love what we do. It's always fun to do something. Spitballers is kind of, it's kind of that where it's like, Hey, we just get to like show up and I I don't know what's on the dock. And I just turn the microphone on and then we talk about crap for an Mm -hmm. hour and then we walk away from it. So, um, anytime you're like knee deep in the content cycle that we're in, anything that's not which, uh, where do I draft? Like Najee Harris is probably like a fun question sometimes. Where though? (laughs) Where though? Uh, oh, where, 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 <laughs> where though? Where though? Uh, I'll let you know after the draft. Uh, hate to hear it. Hate to hear it. All right. So there is a, a sort of a random topic I wanted to talk about. And I guess it goes back to the, what we were talking about, how you guys are very homegrown. You're naturally built. And we've seen this very drastic shift over the last year or so, I'd say, of these, uh, we'll say, quote unquote, dream teams in the fantasy space, kind of putting themselves together, right? You've got brad evans and fade the noise you've got you know evan silva and those guys over at etr you've got fantasy points with scott barrett and graham barfield in them you know and i kind of look at the space and i'm like okay those are the teams those are like the lakers the miami heats they're putting it together (laughs) you guys and us we're like the oklahoma city thunder you know what i mean we're we're homegrown we've known each other we build up from the rookie year and, and and stuff like that so i'm curious from not not on a personal standpoint because i i know most of those guys too and they're really really uh cool guys and most of them will probably end up being on this series and i'll, I'll get their perspective on it but from a business standpoint because again i do think there is something to uh building the foundation together because it feels like the audience is the audience probably feels like they're in a family with you guys like they're best friends with you guys from a business standpoint how do you see those things playing out because in the nba man more often than not those dream teams I don't. I don't know if. I don't know if they. Uh, I don't know if they're built up to the to the hype that they get when they when they come on board. Yeah, I think you know, like like you said, Evan, Brad, incredible people, incredible humans. So thank. I, I'm so happy for them because mm-hmm. one thing I do know from experience in this space is that there are, like, there are a lot of people that work in fantasy that have had to grind and grind and grind with bigger brands. And they haven't gotten the tangible connection to their success that they deserve for Mm -hmm. it. So when I, when I see Brad doing his own thing, or I get to see, you know, Evan go and do his own thing. Like it's almost like a about dang time. You deserve to be in control of your destiny and people are going to follow you and they're going to appreciate your content and what you have. I mean, in terms of there's room, there's room for it. You know, we're not, we never get threatened by it. We never get worried about it we're more just happy for those individuals. It's like the competitive cooperation space that we're in. You know, it's like you and I, like we talk about the same stuff a lot of the time, but there's a, there's a a place for the, the big dog listener and a place for the baller listener and a place for the fade, the noise or the establish the run. To me, that's, that's how we've, we viewed it. So I think those people in specifically are going to see a lot of success and that there's room for it. But I, I agree that there's been a lot more and more of that. I think, you know, once you see one person do it, it's like, okay, we better do that too. We better do that too. You know, I'm sure not everyone's going to succeed at doing it, but it has been interesting to watch because it used to be like, you know, it's the rotor world and it's the NBC and it's the, you know, the big, big players and then the the stars beneath there. But I think a lot of people are, are 
wanting a little bit more control over their day-to-day and a little bit more control over their income. Yeah, and you got to respect that for sure. I'm, I guess I don't question it, but I, I'm, I'm very curious to see how it plays out over over the long run, just like the longevity of not having the the backstory of the brand. Because like when I think about branding, branding is is the story of of who you guys are and like what you've built up to this point. And it's cool to you know mash together a bunch of these stars and these playmakers. And I think it, it can work for a season or two, but sometimes the storyline plays itself out. So I'm just very, I'm just very curious. Uh, on that front to see, you know, how, how things kind of play themselves out um, in, in the space, because they I mean, these are these are you mentioned like people that don't get the the credit for for putting putting the work in. And once you have the leverage of the audience, you know, these guys who are doing the, every time I saw a tweet out there, like Graham would be like, I have an announcement. I'm leaving, you know, fantasy guru. I'll let you guys yeah. know in two months. And I immediately was like, OK, what? I, I like DM'd him. I was like, okay, the dream team. Let, let's let's hear the roster because you could just tell you could see what's happening in the space. They're and pulling in more people. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's been it's been crazy to see and it's been fun to see. And I, I, I'm uh, excited to like hear you know what what the success of their season was and and how they project going forward and things like that. It's fun to uh, it, it's fun to follow along. And yeah, it's interesting for sure. It's, yeah, they definitely it's, have different thoughts about you know what could happen, but I'm excited for those individuals. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of following along, I think I think the whole world kind of stopped and followed along to what was going on when we talk about stonks, man. And I was. I, oh, yeah. It, 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 was, it was last week or two weeks ago, whenever the whole GameStop thing happened, that that was probably the week, I would say, over the last three to four years where I got the least amount of work done. I was absolutely fixated on Robin Hood. I was fixated on my screen on Twitter, on Davy Day Trader. Like I am so I was so obsessed with what was going on. It was so, so interesting. And then we saw a lot of people in the fantasy space on Twitter that, you know, were throwing out the money sign GMEs and you're like, you know, gang gang, like let's let's talk about it a little bit, right? And it got really interesting to see who was kind of in the game. And I'm very, very new to investing in stocks. And uh and and the reason just to like put a little context behind why I'm so interested in this is as we've grown as a business, I'm still trying to figure out how to invest money back into it properly because a lot of the money goes back to me personally and goes into my bank account. And I'm like, I don't, I don't really want that, but I also don't know how much of it to put back into the business and make sure I'm like, cause, cause things are so fluctuating throughout the years and like having the COVID, I didn't know where I should be putting the money, whatever. Uh, point uh, case in point is like, I had a lot of extra cash laying around and I, I'm like, I know just having that sitting in a bank account, that's not you know, increasing or whatever is just a very, very bad thing to have. Let me start looking into investing a little bit more. So, you know, we're looking at crypto, we're doing the Roth IRA, we're looking at, you know, day trading stocks and whatever. So I got into it probably at the most exciting time in the history of the stock market, <laughs> like a month or two stocks, ago. Yeah. yeah, shit has been crazy over the last two months. And I see you tweeting about it. So I'm like, okay, maybe uh, maybe Andy's like really in the game. Is Has investing always been something that you've been uh, very, you know, tuned into or is it something that because you started the business and maybe you had a lot of extra cash laying around like you had you know kind of uh, just dove in yeah i mean it it's something i've always been interested in but it's grown over the years i think a little bit i mean that i'm still auto waking up at 4 30 in the morning on accident right now because of how freaking insane that whole wall street bets period of time was where it's like i'm getting up when pre-market is like hitting so i can you know make sure things are okay and uh, I'm so, refreshing the freaking crypto. All our, the time. our editor, our editor Scott, shout out to Scott. He tweeted out uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was like, you know, the the nine the nine thirty market open is the new NFL red zone. Like countdown dude, on it. I was like, yeah, dude. It's like that was insane, and it, and it gets compounded too because there was so much interest here in the studio. So it's like there's like you know six of us that are like freaking OCD about it. I think it plays into the sport fantasy person's mindset. We like refreshing things. We like checking our phones every two seconds. Like it, it just plays into all of our, uh, all the addictive personality of anybody that plays fantasy and, you know, joins a 10 million leagues. It, it was wild. It's been fun. I mean, I, I really like, you know, I like that. Uh, I like the game. I enjoy, like we we're big, like Tesla supporters over here and stuff. So like, that's, I think we really got more and more into the investing side when like, you have a passion for a handful of brands or individuals or industries or, you know, autonomy and, you know, some of these ETFs you can get into about specific sectors you believe are growing, like renewable ener energy and batteries and things like that. So I think when that kind of world started to percolate like a couple of years ago, uh, I think that's when we started getting more and more interested in it. It's fun. It was fun to be a part of the like 
every like I could I'd post about fantasy and I'd get like 37 Dogecoins replies. That's all I would get <laughs> or, or like GME replies. Like that's when you know nobody, you're doing it right, though. Nobody on, wanted man. to talk about like <laughs> like fantasy players. They'd just be like, yeah, can I get the UDK and Dogecoin? And I, <laughs> I'd, I'd be like, uh, but, can, but can they? Uh, not the UDK, but you can you can buy swag with Bitcoin. Love really. I, I, I hooked that up. Yeah, love that. Uh, but but yeah, no, it, it's fun. It, it's kind of that whole like. I wonder if people because they've been stuck at home too. Like they, this was just the right time for it. Oh, hundred, dude. Look at every look at the entire stock market. It's like as soon as quarantine started, everything has shot up. So I'm. It, it's it's weird though because I don't necessarily think it's going to go down because the economy was was kind of so shot that people got bored. They went onto the stocks. They started buying shit. They see how much hype is behind social media. But the economy's, I mean, I, I can't imagine it gets any worse. It's probably going to keep slowly going up over the next couple of years. So I'd imagine it'll do do well. I just think there's a whole new influx of money in there. So I don't know if it'll go down. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And then vaccine optimism and, and uh, you know, you get to the get to the end of the pandemic. But that's also all of history. Like the stock market's always gone up yeah. for always. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you look at every president that's ever been in office and like there's like three where like it ended worse than it began and the rest of them, it's always gone up. So the real way to invest for like your mental health is to like find, you know, exchange traded funds or like smart investments. And then like, mm -hmm. don't check your, your Robin hood every morning, noon and night. And then just like wake not up, possible. you know, like six months from now. And yeah. yeah, it's not possible. It's way less fun. The fun way to invest is to like go day trade or go try to find the, the go, go live the FOMO life. And then um, do you day trade more? Or are you, or do you treat it more like your business where you look at things very, you know, strategically and actually, uh, you know, intelligently, you know, you throw into what you believe. Cause I, I, I very much relate to what you said with like Tesla. One of the reasons I got into investing is like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of Barstool and obviously Penn buying them. And sure. I think their business model is just flawless. And I think they're going to continue to go up and up and up and up and up and eventually quote unquote, take over the world. So Penn was a, a share a, a stock that I heavily invested into. It's one that I believe in. So most of the time I'm, I'm putting money. Yeah, into that worked out well. Yeah, most of the time I'm putting money into the companies like you did with Tesla that I, I personally believe in and I personally think will go up, not because someone on Twitter told me to do so. The last thing you want to do is lose money on a company you don't believe in, right? If you don't like the way that the, the company is going, but somebody tells you to go invest in it um, and then you lose money on it, that is like the worst feeling you could possibly have. Like that's been the dance like with like fantasy Apple football. stock for me. Like I, I use Apple. I have all Apple products. I really don't love Apple. But I'll like invest in Apple and they'll be like, why do I have Apple? Because I don't really want to believe in some amazing future for Apple. That's that's so I've learned to invest in stocks that you love, that you want to see succeed. I'd rather lose money doing that. And I would say I'm about 70, 30 on the like being smart and then day trading and covered calls and things like that on the other 30 percent. But I do work. I like I don't want to ever use my Twitter platform to like run somebody into the ground on like FOMO hype either. So it was fun being a part of the like. Yeah. Groundswell of individuals. I think there's a, le a level of like retail investors, control of your own money. No one tell me what to do. That's why crypto is so successful in its, in its, you know, uh, structure is because it's like you have control over it. It's me and you, and we make a transaction and the banks aren't there and the regulators aren't there and the stock market's not there and wall street's not there. So it's about the community again, I think, too. This one to like an exponential exponential. You know, you just want to feel like right. you're a part of something. And then once you get it, yeah. even if you didn't know, like, bro, no one thinks that GameStop stock is worth $300 no. in price. But no, if no, you're no. buying it at like 260, you're like, you know, you're in with everybody else. You're like, let's go. You're like, I'm a man of the people. And it is, you know, saying uh, th what you're saying with b buying a stock that you don't believe in. It's like fantasy. It's like for people that I convinced to buy Miles Sanders this year, they didn't want him to begin with, but they took my words, they bought him. And then those are the people that are extra mad at me now. So don't take. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Lose with the Twitter guy that advice. you believe in. <laughs> Yeah. Don't take Twitter advice from people telling you to do stocks. Don't take fantasy advice from me. No. And if you're just hearing about it on Twitter or on TikTok, then um, you're, you weren't you weren't there quick enough. You know what I mean? It's like the people that make money were not, they don't, they didn't run to t TikTok to tell you about it. They, they were in there like six months before you, you heard the TikTok. So yeah. And it's, uh, that's actually a good point. It's almost like uh, creating content. I tell people this a lot, younger kids. I'm like, if you want to be where 
Andy is, you can't do what Andy did to get there, right? Like you're not going to be able to build up a podcast from scratch right now to the number of downloads that they get because that that market they've heard, people have already seen you do that so they've been trying to copy it for a long time you always have to be looking at the next the next best thing that's the same thing with stocks i guess are you are you investing in other things besides stocks because we've seen fantasy twitter go any anything that you can make a quick penny oh, on like you know uh, like nba top shot or it's or sports like, cards uh, it's top shots it's, and you know nothing and digital art nothing against those people at all but my the, the way I look at it is like okay, people make money in real estate, right? Real estate is For a sure. great is a great investment. It doesn't mean that yeah. you need to be on top of it. You don't need to be trying to make money all the time. I would say like a smart piece of advice was whatever you're investing in. Again, make sure that it's something that's personal to you, something that you enjoy. Like I tried getting into the sports cards craze. Like I was nuts about sports cards when I was ten, eleven, twelve, and I got into Same. it a little bit this year. You know, I was able to get boxes and do a couple box breaks on my channel, but I realized really quickly like. You know, I'm not as passionate about it. I don't have the time to invest and really watch the market on these things. So I kind of pivoted away. And that was something I probably could have made a lot of money if I if I put a little bit more effort into it. I was like, I'm not really about it, though. Is, are there anything, uh, any things that like kind of pop off to you that you maybe do invest in or could see yourself investing in over over the long uh, long term? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the two main ones are just the market and then the, the crypto universe. Like, I, I really do believe in Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and like the structurally sound long term type of um, you know, you just saw Tesla invest $1.5 billion in, of their cash into, into Bitcoin. So I think more companies may follow that. And that's some play, that's an interesting space that I really like because it's the technology side of it too. You know, my son and I, we went out and spent money on first edition Pokemon card packs, you know, and, and opened them really? together. And we did. Yeah. I had a couple, wow. I got a couple packs of like, uh, like the OG fossil and jungle packs. And we did like a, you know, had to pay you know, like a thousand dollars a pack and we opened them together and, got the hollows out of them and sent them in to get graded by PSA. Did your and that son was like a, even know what Pokemon was or did he, was he dude, just my, like involved in the, the whole in the reason packs. I did it was because my son is obsessed with Pokemon. So okay. it was like, Hey, I could do this. Maybe we make some money. Maybe we don't, but either way, like I've got this awesome memory with my nine year old of opening these two packs that are legendary to him that, you know, I was buying when I was in seventh grade and they were 50 cents a pack or whatever. Dude, I can't believe you didn't do like an op like a box opening video on that. Like I should, I really should have. Yeah, <laughs> I should have. But at the same time, it was like, it wasn't even about that. It was just like, uh, hey, th this is this is something he when he finds out this pack shows up, he's gonna freak out and it'll be fun and maybe we'll make my money, maybe we won't. I tried to get back into the sports cards too. Like I was just like you. Like my whole life was sports cards growing up. Like I loved it. Like I, especially NBA cards. Like that was my favorite thing. Opening packs, collecting them, going to card auctions. But I couldn't find myself like you, you can only do so many things in the day, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I couldn't find my like I was doing it just enough to where I like I couldn't dive in. And I, I and if you can't dive in and be fully into it, it's like I wasn't going to make money. I wasn't going to really enjoy it. It's also so, with our work like you. I mean, we follow football so intensely. I don't you know, when I was younger, I loved baseball. I loved following basketball, but like I don't have yep. time to follow those. And those are the markets you really need to be in. And you need to be you know, you need to know like the backup point guard and whether or not his his card went from six cents to seven cents or six cents to four cents today i'm just like dude i you gotta I be on the gary v that. level the gary v level of knowledge yeah it's just at, yeah, or the just, adam left go yeah it's just out of control knowledge. levels of energy for these sports cards that i just like they're, they're just not there for me but i found myself it was nuts man because i was you know pokemon was there when when we were younger like right in my prime oh, yeah. of collecting those kind of things and when the, the the craze of this stuff started happening i was literally on youtube for like hours watching people open up the first edition pokemon Dude, it's cards exciting it's fun like i i told my parents i'm like if they didn't throw my pokemon cards out i probably don't even have a podcast because i'm probably the richest man alive i had so many freaking cards that they threw away ridiculous but, bro. but it is funny and it, it is you kind of get sucked into any of it like it's the community right you talked about like that pokemon box breaking my son's watching them all day long i'm like oh this is actually really exciting that guy is really excited to get that card yeah, dude, it's uh, it's so much fun, especially when you get the nostalgic uh, piece of it, because we're like, you know, no we're like doubt. the OGs, eh? like we know what oh, these yeah, are. Man. You know what I mean? It's not about I was money at the for us. Toys R Us when that thing came out. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. So, you know, Funny. speaking of speaking of like just different things that you invest in because you believe in them. You mentioned Elon, and I did see you just tweet out about something about like Starlink, and I don't even know what that is, but I'm assuming <laughs> that's just like you kind of just believe in most of the Elon products that he puts out nowadays. Right, and, right. You know, you're kind of just a fanboy over there. Are there other companies, businesses, brands, personal brands, creators, entrepreneurs, whatever, that 
that you personally just like look up to, admire, you think that they do a great job in business overall? Because like, I, you know, I, again, I mentioned Barcelona. I think they're great with media. Like I've looked up to and I, um, I aspire to be what you guys are doing over there is I think incredible and paving a way for the fantasy business. Are there people that you, you know, look up to? Are there people that kind of paved the way for you from a, from a business mindset? I have a lot of respect um, for David Kim and the fan- the people at Fantasy Pros and what he's built. And I know that there's like a lot of like in the fantasy community, they get a lot of grief and there are people that don't like some of the things that they've done with the rankings. And I'm with you. Uh, I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of what they've built, too. But I know I know Dave and he he's a shrewd, smart business guy. I think he's a good dude. I think he takes care of his employees. And I think he's just really. I, I just think what they do, like, I always know that they're going to be on top of things. And um, so I think from, you know, just the sidelines, I have a lot of respect for what they do and the things that they put their time and effort into, um, regardless of other people's opinions, I, I have a lot of respect for him. So, you know, that they were definitely one of the companies that you can look at and and have a lot of a great deal of just respect for how they run it. I think, you know, I've always said like Dan Patrick and what they do, like that was always a big inspiration for us and like his his show and their vibe and their feeling and the brand that they had was something that I think early on we respected. So those are kind of the ones that jump out to me. You know, you mentioned Elon and the whole, his whole universe. Uh, that's just been fun to watch. Cause I like seeing innovation, anybody that's doing innovative things, anybody that's thinking differently about, you know, tomorrow than, than the wall street estimates, uh, you know, following some algorithm, think about tomorrow and exponential growth and industries like that stuff's fun. I mean, I think that's engaging content. You ever thought and- about when I think of those guys, like I love, you know, the Elon Musk and the, and the Jeff Bezos of the world. And I think the reason I have like an inherent love or respect for what they do is because it goes back to my problem of, of um, I guess, delegating in a sense. I have such a such a tough time being like, oh, you you can do this and I trust you to do it, even though like I feel like I could do it best. When you look at them, do, have you ever thought about what it would be like to actually run a business that was, and you guys are obviously scaling and you have a number of full-time employees, but like, do you think you'd be able to run a business that was, you know, a hundred people, 500 people, a thousand people? Like that's so overwhelming, but like people do it and they do it successfully. It's wild. I know it's great. Mark, Mark Cuban comes to mind too. Like the, all the stuff that he runs and the fact he can like speak into all these areas with such knowledge, like my answer is no, I'd probably never be able to do that. Like these are, these are just unbelievable individuals. Um, but at the same time, like when you read about, you know, Elon and you read about the beginning of Tesla and you read about the journey, like it's not, it looks great now, like, but it wasn't always great. You know, he had to learn how to talk to people like a human being and not mm-hmm. alienate every single person of his staff. Like there are growing pains for all of these individuals. You see them on the top of the mountain now, but maybe I'd feel different in five years or 10 years or you know, I didn't think I'd be running a business with any full-time employees when this thing began. So again, it's, it's, are, are you structured in a way where you have great people around you? If you have great people around you, you can do a lot Yeah. when you can trust individuals and, and our team, you know, it's like, I just spend half my day being thankful for them. That's about yeah. it. It's you almost know? like, uh, you know, when, when creators are starting out, it's, I think they overwhelm themselves with looking at people like you who have such large followings in the space and they're like oh i don't know if i could ever do what they did i'll never get to that point but i guess it's is that like journey along the way that you learn the things that you need to learn in order to perform at that level you know like you guys put on the show whatever five times a week and it's not like you're stepping in there like oh my god we're about to perform in front of two hundred thousand people it's a normal thing for you at that point but at the beginning it's not so i look at it too i'm like okay running a hundred two hundred fifty person company i'm like there's no chance in hell i'd be able to do that successfully i don't know maybe if you're in that spot you really could yeah, because it's one foot in front of the other, right? I mean, yeah. I, I think it's like, uh, like you said, it would be really intimidating to think of, can I handle these 57 things? And I think it's Jordan Peterson that said, you know, like if you're feeling really overwhelmed, like set lower goals, like set yourself a few goals that you can get to and then like pat yourself on the back and check the box and go to the next one. You know, it's it's not zero to 100 miles an hour on day one. Yeah, I think that's a good mindset to have. And for people just starting off in the industry, of course, you want to set your goals high, but I understand that, You'll be just as excited for the little, you know, check marks along the way as some of the bigger creators here that hit bigger check marks that look like they're on a pedestal to you. But, you know, you get that five subscribers, you get that 50 subscribers, you get that 100 subscribers along the way. Those will feel just as good as a lot of the milestones that the bigger creators hit along the way as well. And uh, yeah, 
I want to say that 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 about wraps up most of the questions or things that I had on the uh, on the sheet for you today. Unless there's, uh, I guess you know, we did have the news this morning of uh, Roto World kind of being overtaken <laughs> by NBC Sports Edge. I want to say the uh, the word is, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I didn't. Re- yeah, no questions. I I think they're they're keeping all the staff, and it's all the same thing. They're just like rebranding it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Not really. I mean, I I saw I, I saw Evan tweet the like peace sign and. And like I went and checked it out and now it's now it's blue instead of red and it's got a different logo. But, um, you know, they've been owned since I think 06 by NBC and they just I don't know. They I when I when I first heard the news, I thought they were gone, gone. And I me, was like, me that too. is called it's like burning, burning money. <laughs> Seems really stupid. Yeah, um, it, it feels like they just don't. I, I don't know. Like, I uh, I don't know I, what they have. <laughs> Like, I, I just don't think they, you know, m- maybe we think they have more than they do and they probably know better than we do. But like from right, where we right. sit, it feels like these guys are, you know, if nothing else, just like monumental pieces of this industry and will continue to grow and continue to grow in an industry that is in itself growing exponentially. Like, I don't, it feels like NBC doesn't really see any ceiling for where the fantasy space is going, letting the guys like Evan Silva walk and changing the name as if the Roto World brand doesn't mean anything, which is so far from the truth. No, it seems super stupid. Yeah. I mean, uh, on, it's like it's a part of a larger property and it's they don't have a concept of what it's represented or what its potential value is. And I think it was heading that way a long, long, long time before uh, the the banner changed colors. You know, it was like the writing was on the wall, letting letting great people leave. And yeah, it's it's unfortunate, you know, because they could have done a lot with it. Still could. <laughs> But I mean, it began what like last year. You couldn't even get the Roto World app anymore. Like it's deleting the brand, yeah. and like you had to get the NBC News app. And there was a l- I can't remember a bathroom trip. I haven't refreshed that old Roto World app until they deleted it. So that was devastating. Definitely, I hated that. yeah, definitely sucked. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that was that was interesting news. Yeah, I just figured I I throw it up on uh, on sure. here. So that's uh that's that's all we got. Unless there are any other uh, pressing topics or questions or comments concerns. Uh, from your side over there, always concerned about you, Nick. Always concerned. But, Likewise, um, I'm more concerned about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned about that hat. I'm concerned about the valley. The whole valley thing. The, va- the valley of the sun is doing well. <laughs> well. We got it on lockdown over here. You just take care. Someday we'll we'll get to travel back uh, or travel, I guess, uh, anywhere. So that would be cool. And maybe we'll come uh, come back there, and and there'll be another conference or two, or. The live so shows, we can, man. We can have a, a white Russian in together. So someday. I would, I would love nothing more. So uh, thank you guys out there for listening, for watching. If you're on YouTube, of course, make sure you're following Andy. Uh, all of his links, Twitter, Instagram, their YouTube channel, their podcast and stuff will be linked in the description down below. If you enjoyed our talk, make sure you hit the button that looks like this. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're going to be doing one of these talks each week, bringing on a new uh person to fill andy's shoes and uh hopefully bring on a different hat over there but again thank you andy for uh, thank you andy for joining us it was it was a pleasure as always and uh we'll talk to you next time take care man how you doing Hey, I'm asking the questions here.